happens to you and then you can start. Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to all the participants uh, on this webinar on uh, green hydrogen in India. So we have a very esteemed uh, list of panelists who will be sharing their views on different aspects of green hydrogen in India. And we will begin with uh, Mr. Pashupati Gopalan, uh, CEO of Sun Edison. And uh, he is going to be talking about the basics of green hydrogen, the fundamentals for us to understand what really the concept is all about. So, so over to you. Sapna, how much time do I have? So we are looking at seven to eight minutes. Acha, that's how much you want me to cover, okay? Yeah. All right. I'll have to be quick then. I think uh, my so understanding is to... about 40, 45 minutes. So I'll, I'll just be very quick then. I'll make some points. Um, so... You know, as we as we look at the country's energy policy, there are multiple factors that we have to straddle and think about. Um, you know, as we are looking at decarbonization, I'm sure all of you have understood that while electricity itself, there is a lot of emphasis on renewable energy, but rest of the energy consumption in the, in the country, uh, electricity only represents about, let's say, 25-30% of our overall consumption of energy. The rest of it is predominantly fossil fuel based, which is coal and oil. And as we, as we think about transitioning to a completely <clears throat> decarbonized economy, we have to worry about multiple factors. Economic growth is obviously very important. We cannot go backwards. Energy independence is important because we are importing significant amount of oil and other energy sources like ammonia and coal. And if the country were to grow to five or seven and a half trillion dollars by this decade, then those imports can doubled and tripled, so which is very difficult for a country of our size. Uh, and clearly, climate change is becoming more and more important. And what's going to happen is there is going to be intense pressure from the world. You know, consumers everywhere are going to demand for greener products. And even if the countries don't want to, I think it's going to become clear that the society is going to demand for greener products. The last but not the least is how do you preserve the existing infrastructure and assets you have? For example, what do you do with the gas stations if you're going to completely switch to something different than gasoline uh, or oil? So those are some of the considerations that we have to think about. Um, I'm sure all of you know that India is the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases, and we cannot grow the same way that perhaps some of the more developed countries have grown by using fossil fuel. And we really have to figure out a more green path to grow and keep our economy growing. I'll come back to this point about the support India needs to receive or ask for from um, other countries. You know, when I, when I think about India, I think, uh, and I think about this energy transition and the opportunity, there are five pillars. Again, some of this is quite common. Everybody will know. And, and maybe power electronics, something that you hadn't thought about. You know, solar is clearly important. And it's good to see that India is finally, after nearly a, a decade, is taking steps in the right direction to create a domestic solar manufacturing ecosystem and do the needful for that. It still doesn't go deep enough to create substantial capacity on polysilicon and uh, silicon wafers, uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's a very good start. I think where we have been lacking is solar rooftops. I think uh, India does not realize that there is probably a half a terawatt or close to 500 gigawatts of capacity possible if we were to set up solar rooftops in every roof in the country. Some countries, the penetration levels are 10 times more than India. Globally, there is about you know, 300 plus gigawatts of solar rooftop already. And India is lagging far, far behind. I think India probably does not even figure in top 10 nations when it comes to solar rooftop. And everywhere I go, I do ask for the policymakers to look at it because 
when you spend money on solar rooftops, you can avoid the upgrades and expenditure to transmission and distribution systems because solar rooftop deliver energy where the consumers are present and can use. In the case of hydrogen as well, this is going to be very interesting because one can imagine a solar rooftop system running a small electrolyzer and giving a home or a small building round the clock energy supply. Wind needs to become very important because as the economy is going to transition and start using large amounts of hydrogen, hydrogen assets can run 24 by 7, but solar can only support that perhaps four or five hours, which is only 20% of the time. So you need wind also, and solar and wind nicely sort of uh, uh, are non, somewhat non-overlapping in India. And you can get maybe about 60% utilization of the hydrogen assets if you were to combine wind. Batteries, again, in, in batteries, I think uh, there's a lot of, lot of talk and uh, uh, I'm sure the penetration of electric vehicle is very, very remarkable every passing month. But we do need to think about a clear national policy and think of battery as a whole asset class where we are implementing lithium-ion phosphate batteries in people's homes and off-grid and, and hybrid locations for customers. That's not happening, and that's also very important for the country. Power electronics is something that ties up all of this. I think uh, everything that we're dealing with in energy is relates to power, and it's very, very important to make our country uh, a significant contributor to the world of power electronics, and currently we are not. It's a very critical pillar for the country. So, you know, coming to today's topic about uh, hydrogen is... Uh, you know, I've already mentioned that it's it's a promising resource. I'm going to I'm going to skip some slides given the time constraint. I understand. Uh, you know, this is the basic physics and chemistry of how hydrogen is generated. You all know about renewable energy already, and you are essentially building systems where water is broken into hydrogen and oxygen, and you collect the hydrogen. So essentially, the raw material for this is just water and renewable energy. You don't need anything else. All right, so these equipment that do this are called electrolyzers. And what's happening is the process is called electrolysis. I think the world has changed dramatically in the last couple of years, and more than half a trillion dollars worth of projects have been announced covering industrial use, transportation, completely sort of giga scale production of hydrogen, like in cities uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, Neom, all of you must have heard of as well. So I think a lot of possibilities and uh, this has happened. And our, our estimate is by, by 2050, the hydrogen market can be somewhere in the range of 700 to 1400 metric million tons, which is between 10 and 20 times what the current market for hydrogen is. So it's going to become a substantial contributor to the world's energy needs. Somewhere between a fourth and half of energy, primary energy is going to be met with hydrogen. Why is that the case? Because of the economics. I think uh, green hydrogen, based on some assumptions that we've listed below, will be cheaper than gray hydrogen, which is a current way of producing hydrogen. India uses about 6 million metric tons of hydrogen a year between refineries and fertilizer plants mostly. And all of that gray hydrogen can be converted to green hydrogen. Currently, the source of gray hydrogen is methane or natural gas. The, the more remarkable fact is, I think, way, with the way things are working, as we speak right now, hydrogen is cheaper than diesel. So anytime when we have long-haul transportation, call it a, you know, a truck that, that's carrying goods or buses that are plying between cities, all of those transportation applications can shift from diesel to hydrogen economically. And here the, here the diesel that I've taken is actually without any taxes and duties. So you're looking at about 35, 40 rupees a liter, as opposed to the current market price, which includes the taxes. Even with that, I think hydrogen is going to become cheaper than diesel. So essentially, this can happen right now. So... I think uh, India, the, the point I was going to make, I think just in this slide is all the ingredients exist to make India the hydrogen hub for the world. 
and offer this possibility for us. Uh, clearly, one of the things that we've been con constantly asking for is when the Prime Minister in 2014 announced, uh, or yeah, I think 2014 announced the uh, national uh, photovoltaic plan with 100 gigawatts, which was later expanded to 180, including renewables, other renewables like wind, it created a certain uh, environment for everybody in the world to come and invest in India. And you see so many companies like NL and uh, NG and so many others come and invest in India and make India their hub, Total as well. So I think something similar to that has to happen where we need to have a, a reasonably aggressive goal which will send the signal to companies like Toyota and Hyundai to come in and make this market an important market for them. As some of you may know, Toyota already has a, a third generation hydrogen car called Mirai. Uh, and uh, and as some, they've, they've brought a couple of those cars into India. But the whole point is for them to make India an important market where they come and promote this and work with the likes of Indian Oil Corporation and BPCL and HPCL to create the hydrogen gas stations. So, you know, we've laid out different targets, which might be interesting, but the whole point is uh, India, we believe, can, can, can develop and build its hydrogen industry to generate about 20 million metric tons of hydrogen by 2030 uh, and, and about 5 million metric tons by 2025. And uh, 5 would essentially be nearly 75-80% of the grey hydrogen market is converted to green hydrogen. Is some of the some of the applications which are pretty straightforward with hydrogen is um, uh, in refineries gray hydrogen is used which can be converted to green hydrogen um, and in uh, ammonia production which is used for fertilizers green hydrogen can be used and also wherever natural gas is being used one can blend up to even 20 percent and that's that's what the studies show to hydrogen and still use the existing assets of natural gas which is a hydrogen blending. The other interesting applications, of course, are you know, steel. For example, if new steel capacities are being built in India, should we not be building them with hydrogen? You know, Sweden, Sweden and many other countries have, have been working on it, but Sweden's already proven that one can make hydrogen steel. Uh, and if there is going to be a demand for green steel market led by countries like Germany, I think, uh, should we not be converting our capacities to hydrogen-based steel? You know, we've, we've talked about some of these things. I think a lot of policy decisions have already been taken by the uh, central government, by Honorable Minister R.K. Singh, to support uh, hydrogen. The, the, the policy note which came out last week allows for a waiver of interstate transmission charges for hydrogen projects and also banking, which will make hydrogen, delivered cost of hydrogen, competitive and closer to gray hydrogen. We've already talked about the signal point. I'll skip it. This is an interesting point. And as journalists, I think you all can make a huge difference here. Now, as the world is, as the world is working hard to decarbonize and reduce the climate change impact, one has to think about this is a problem that's facing the whole planet. It's not just India. It's not just China. The whole planet is being affected. Our existence is being challenged. In that case, if our existence is being questioned, the country boundaries and border don't make any sense. We have to unite as one single world. And if the world has resources, you know, if you if you add up these dollars, this is this is tens and tens and hundreds of billions of dollars. Should the world not be spending the money? where there will be the biggest bang for buck and where the impact on greenhouse gas emission reversal happens the fastest. And if you think about it, you can each one of you can do your own further research based on everything we have done. If someone has a dollar to spend to reduce carbon emissions, we believe the right place to spend that money, India will rank very, very high on that list of priorities. And the world should be giving money to India so that India can grow without dependence on fossil fuel and, and, and make an abrupt and rapid, aggressive transition to uh, decarbonizing the economy. 
I mean, it's it's one thing. I'm sure the political leaders have uh, they have to be concerned and they they make promises of 2070. But I think in reality, if the developed nations were to support India, this can happen a lot faster. And hydrogen combined with renewables can by and large significantly hydrogen renewables, power electronics and batteries can essentially decarbonize India very, very rapidly. But they need the support of the developed nations and the G7. So, you know, I, I represent OMEM. I'm not going to take too much time. We decided if this is what India offers to the world, even though we're an American company, we've decided to make India our home. 95% of our workforce is in India. Everything we do in technology development, R&D, which is state of the art, is done out of India. All our manufacturing is in India. And we put India in the map of hydrogen manufacturing. We built a gigafactory. And this is essentially, when we counted, it's about 25% of the world's capacity. So we have made India one amongst the four nations that has an electrolyzer a gigafactory, and we can expand it a lot more. We have started exporting out of India as well. So we're starting to make the, uh, make the transition, both energy transition, energy independence transition, and trying to make hydrogen a, a weapon for India to become far more developed and far more uh, economically advanced. I'll stop here. I think I've taken uh, probably two or three minutes more than I wanted to. If any of you wants to get in touch with me, I think the best is my WhatsApp number. Uh, so I've, I've listed it here. I can, I, I'll stop now and Sapna, you can tell me if uh, you want me to take questions now or later, but uh, it's, it's your call. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for that insightful and detailed presentation. I'm sure our participants will uh, benefit greatly. Um, so we will take questions towards the end of the webinar, you know, because it will keep coming in the Q&A box. So we'll take questions end of the webinar. So we'll go on, move on to our uh, next uh, speaker. Mainly. Our uh, next speaker is uh, energy economist, uh, Ms. Vibhuti Karg. And she's the India lead at the Institute for uh, Energy Economics and uh, Financial Analysis, also called as IFA. Uh, Vibhuti, over to you, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sapna. And a very good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, you know, I would like to congratulate the government on the issue of much awaited green hydrogen policy. Uh, India has been kind of a late starter in solar module manufacturing and even electric vehicles, and we kind of missed the golden opportunity to kind of drive the cost advantages of economies of scale. However, with the deployment of green hydrogen, India is kind of ensuring that the building blocks are ready in place for a hydrogen economy. And the idea is not only to meet its domestic needs, but also to kind of become an export hub, which is like uh, not only we'll be able to uh, support our, our decarbonization goals for the hard to abate sectors, which are in like fertilizer manufacturing, oil refining or others. But at the same time, you know, it will enable the government to meet its other objectives of energy security, energy self-reliance, as well as reducing imports of expensive fossil fuels, and thereby kind of reducing the import bill as well. So it's, there's a huge opportunity to build a new billion dollar industry that will also help in creating more and more jobs. I won't go into the details of the policy, which uh, will be talked in greater detail by the other speakers. I will just kind of uh, focus on the cost economics of green hydrogen. So the policy kind of tackles the supply chain or the supply side aspects, but the demand for green hydrogen will be largely dependent on its cost. Currently, uh, green hydrogen cost is ranging between four and a half to five and a half uh, US dollar per kg compared to uh, gray hydrogen cost, which is below two US dollars per kg and which is based on the natural gas. So now for greater adoption at a larger scale, it is critical that renewable energy as well as the electrolyzers cost, which are the major components driving the cost of green hydrogen go down in the next few years. Bloomberg NEF predicts the levelized cost of solar PV will go down from about 60 US dollar megawatt hours in 2021 to 30 US dollars megawatt hours 
uh, by 2030 and further to 20 US dollars megawatt hours by 2050. The cost of green hydrogen is also predicted to fall to uh, somewhere ranging between 0.9 to 3 US dollars per kg by 2030 and 0.7 to 1.8 US dollars per kg by 2050. the transportation costs which is another big element government is tackling it kind of by you know uh, promoting production of green hydrogen near the consumption center so instead of kind of transporting the molecules the hydrogen government has incentivized transmission of renewable energy and this is likely to save costs uh, for the green hydrogen developers as per IOC you know uh, they have done this competition and that the new policy will help cut the cost of manufacturing of green hydrogen by 40 to 50 percent which i feel is a little bit on the higher side but clearly uh, this policy support definitely we see some price gains happening um the calculation was based on this uh, that the cost of renewable energy electricity is rupees 2 per kilowatt hour but the price at the gen which is at the generation side but uh when you do transport uh, the transmission of electricity uh you know after adding all these levies and these cross subsidy surcharge and the transmission charges it becomes 4 to 7 rupees per unit in different states depending upon uh the amount of distance it needs to travel so at this price the green hydrogen production cost comes to about 500 per kg this cost is expensive and compared to the current grey hydrogen cost of 150 rupees per kg so with all these waivers the cost is likely to go down substantially so that's a definitely a uh, uh, will give a lot of boost to production of green hydrogen now uh, another cost which i talked about was on the cheaper electrolyzer so rather than importing india needs to kind of combine it with ultra low cost renewables backed by clear policy support uh, in order to realize the hydrogen potential so unlike you know just focusing on the end product i think we need to really develop the full ecosystem uh, which now we are even doing for the solar uh P- solar renewable energy generation by or the renewable energy by building now the domestic manufacturing of modules cells vapors polysilicon so we really need to now ensure that the entire ecosystem gets developed and we are moving in that pathway further in to improve the commercial viability of green hydrogen the prices of renewable energy will have to be below uh, rupees 2 per kilowatt hour we have seen players like ntpc kind of eyeing a uh, uh, $2 per kg benchmark cost by financial year 2025 26 uh, and reliance in fact targeting uh, us dollar 1 per kg by 2030 and they have plans to do big investments to the extent of uh, you know 75 us dollars billion in renewable infrastructure which also includes not only generation plants solar panels but electrolyzers as well uh, we have seen reliance kind of making uh, uh, partnerships with uh, renewable pioneers like hendrix tisdel to develop and manufacture you know even the electrolyzers further very recently yesterday we read adani group and balad power systems have joined hands to kind of evaluate a joint investment in hydrogen fuel cells uh, manufacturing in india so green hydrogen is kind of becoming the fuel of the future and fuel cells will be a game changer in india's energy transition as well the cost will go down with the economies of scale clearly india can in fact you know um, take the leadership by taking early mover advantage and be the export hub i read somewhere india is uh, may soon become the middle east of green hydrogen i think that's a very positive development if if that uh, if india is able to kind of uh, you know achieve economies and move things uh, to their advantage both the public and the private sector are quite upbeat, upbeat sorry and with the right policies and incentives we can definitely become one of the world leaders in green hydrogen production um i'm going to end here thanks uh, for this opportunity happy to take on any questions later thank you thanks so much vibhuti so um 
please direct your questions uh, to all our panelists in the Q&A box and they'll answer your questions. Uh, so uh, I just quickly, uh, before our next uh, panelist uh, comes on, I just give a quick uh, brief into a little bit on the policy uh, which the Indian government uh, announced recently and how it could help uh, various uh, sectors in India. So Arushi, uh, if you can just uh, play the slides for me, please. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you. So as we all know, uh, we are speaking about uh, green hydrogen and how it is possibly the fuel of the future. Uh, so please, the next slide, Arushi. So uh, this uh, policy that was announced re uh, recently uh, is being looked uh, upon as being uh, extremely uh, good for the renewable energy sector because it promises cheaper renewable power for one. Also, as uh, Mr. Pashupati pointed out in his presentation, he also mentioned about the fact that there is fee waiver for interstate power transmission for 25 years and for projects that have been commissioned before June 2025. Uh, additionally, uh, the land in RE parks uh, is likely to help local industry uh, wean themselves off uh, fossil fuels. So uh, can we move on to the next slide, please, Arshi? Thank you. So it is also being looked upon as uh, the great enabler. So because uh, green hydrogen, mm -hmm. as mentioned earlier by uh, Mr. Pashupati, is devoid of any greenhouse emissions. And be it the automobile or the steel or the refinery industry, there are no emissions whatsoever. Uh, the target, uh, just the previous, the, so the intermediate target is that by the year 2030, India will reduce greenhouse gas emission by 1 billion tons from the current level. And if this has to happen, then green hydrogen is going to be a major enabler in the process. So the next slide, please. So apart from the other industry, which uh, I sectors I mentioned, uh, it's also conducive for the oil, steel, and the fertilizer industry. It is uh, being seen that the recent policy announced announcement by the Indian government will make it more economical for key users of hydrogen and ammonia, such as the oil refining, fertilizer, and steel sectors to produce green hydrogen for their own use. Next slide. So uh, there are incentives that uh, were announced for green hydrogen, and the government said that it is set to provide a single portal for all clearances required for setting up green hydrogen production and a facility for producers to bank any surplus renewable energy that is generated with discounts, which is the distribution companies in India for up to 30 days and use it as required. So this is one of the incentives that was announced as part of the policy. The policy also aims to boost export of green hydrogen like Mr. Pashupati and uh, Vibhuti also in both uh, their uh, presentation and talk mentioned about the fact that India has immense potential, not just within India, but also exporting, uh, becoming a major, major exporter of green hydrogen. So in this uh, particular aspect, it has been said that the port authorities uh, will provide land at applicable charges to green hydrogen and green ammonia producers to set up bunkers near the ports for storage prior to export. So, and uh, Power Minister Mr. R.K. Singh was recently quoted in the media saying that Germany and Japan could be the key markets for green hydrogen which is produced in India. So, um, so this is uh, very briefly about uh, touched upon the policy and to speak uh, about the policy in detail, uh, we just move on to our uh, next panelist, uh, Mr. Heman Malia. So Mr. Heman Malia is actually the senior program lead uh, at uh, Industrial Sustainability and Competitiveness at the Council of Energy, Environment and Water, also known as uh, CEEW. So over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sapna. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for having me on this panel. Uh, I don't have a presentation. I'll just speak through my notes. Uh, so Sapna talked about the policy that was uh, recently announced by the Ministry of Power, uh, which was specifically targeting the reduction or actually waving off of uh, transmission charges, interstate transmission charges uh, for production of green hydrogen. Now, it is important to understand why this is such an enabling uh, policy. 
uh, if you look at the cost of uh, delivered cost of green hydrogen, um, if it's from the cost uh, from the point of production uh, up to the point of end use, uh, the longer the distance, the more complicated it becomes to move hydrogen because moving the physical molecules is very very expensive. So it's preferable to actually move the power and generate it at the point of use, uh, and therefore from an uh, from an efficiency perspective. Uh, or even from a cost perspective, it's better to actually move the power, wield the power, and uh, not try to move the physical molecules. So from that perspective, this policy, you know, certainly is going in the right direction. Um, another point or, um, you know, metric to remember is of the uh, production cost of hydrogen, roughly 50 to 70% of the cost comes from the cost of power input. Uh, now, it depends totally on where it's produced, uh, but that's a significant share of the total cost. So to the extent that we can reduce the cost of power, uh, either by waiving off some of these charges and taxes, et cetera, or by reducing the cost of generation itself, uh, the cost of hydrogen will go down substantially. Uh, just to give you an example, let's say in the state of UP, uh, if UP wheels in, uh, let's say, wind energy from Gujarat uh, and produces green hydrogen in the state, then by waiving off the interstate charges, we can reduce the cost of uh, production by about 17%. Now that's substantial. Um, however, having said that, uh, we need to recognize that there are two kinds of charges that constitute the delivered price of power. One is what the central, uh, you know, ministries levy or the you know central government levy, uh, and one which is the state levy. Uh, what has been waived in this policy is the central, uh, you know, what we call open access charges, which is a charge to move between uh, power between states. Now, any state that does not have good quality renewable energy. Uh, will have to depend on other states to wield power. So in this case, what will happen is the interstate charges are waived. However, this intrastate, meaning the state, uh, you know, specific uh, charges, I have not yet been waived, right? So uh, that is still going to be a, a part of the total cost. Uh, and the other point is that uh, it is up to the individual states to allow for that power to be wielded. So although the uh, central government has waived the charges, a state can still decide that it does not want to move the power to produce green hydrogen, in which case uh, the policy gets blunted. Um, also, there is a significant disparity in the charges that states levy. For example, uh, you know, UP has the lowest uh, open access charge at about 25 paisa, whereas Maharashtra has about 2.3 rupees per unit. So there is a almost you know multiplier of 10 uh, difference there. So this can result in disparity in the production cost of green hydrogen, and that can be problematic because it will completely distort the market in the longer run. So the states need to think about how do they enable uh, or further enhance the policy that has come from the you know central side. Uh, otherwise, you know it could be problematic in terms of the ecosystem development. Um, the other point that was a part of the policy is what we call banking. Uh, banking essentially means that. Uh, during the day, you know, in the case of solar or in the night, uh, in the case of wind, um, the power generation is not a flat line. So you see ups and downs. If there's a cloud, the power production goes down in the solar, you know, park, uh, and so on and so forth. So the power generation is, you know, constantly uh, changing, and the electrolyzer may not be able to take all of the power. So if there is excess power then the power uh, the hydrogen producer or the you know uh, renewable energy developer can supply the excess power into the grid and bank it and then take it back from the grid at a later point when that power is necessary so uh, that is also a very uh, important aspect of uh, reducing the cost of uh, hydrogen uh, production cost because the more you can bank the smoother the operation of the electrolyzer and the higher the efficiency of the electrolyzer which will positively uh, impact the reduction in the cost. Um, from our quick analysis, back of the envelope, we believe that uh, if there is no cap on the amount of power that can be banked uh, and there are no charges for banking, then the cost of hydrogen can come down by up to 40%. Now, it totally depends on the state and, and uh, uh, other factors, but all other things being equal, you, know, you can uh, generate a substantial reduction in cost. Uh, so that's about banking. Um, one quick point to note about the policy is that the policy, uh, the waiver for interstate charges is you know, limited to all projects that are uh, in operation by 2025. Now, that's slightly problematic because you know, we anticipate it will take another year or two before uh, projects uh, are put in place. 
uh, and also because we don't have blending norms yet. So there needs to be some market for green hydrogen before developers can start deploying their capacity for production. Uh, however, we don't see that market yet. So it could be another two, three years before that market is created. Uh, and by that time, you know, we'll have only one or two years where the interstate charges uh, uh, or waiver is available. So from our perspective, that 2025 timeline should probably be moved to something like a 2030, uh, which will make the policy uh, a little bit more favorable uh, in terms of, um, you know, the offtake of green hydrogen in the longer term. Uh, so that's what we have seen in terms of the policy that has already come up. Uh, however, there is a lot of confusion as to what that policy is because the title suggests that it's the main hydrogen policy, but it's not. What it is is an enabling policy. The main mission document is still pending. So we can hope to see some uh, more um, you know, uh, incentives uh, and market creation uh, you know, measures, uh, which will come through the mission document. Now, based on what has been publicly said by the ministries in charge uh, and the ministers in charge, uh, we can see two you know, we hope to see at least uh, two major uh, policy initiatives. One is, of course, the market creation. So you can have a lot of uh, excitement uh, at the supply end, but unless there's a market, you know, the capacity will not get deployed. So as of now, uh, Mr. Gopalan earlier said about 6 million ton. Our estimate is about 5.5 million tons uh, of hydrogen is currently being utilized. So there is, you know, it's important to recognize that the hydrogen is not a new um, you know, energy source. Um, it's been in use for a long time. Uh, right now, it's primarily used as a feedstock uh, in refineries, fertilizers, and petrochemicals, uh, and a little bit of methanol. Uh, and that is probably the easiest to displace, uh, easiest being a relative term. But that quantum is something that we're already using. Uh, and so market creation needs to happen to displace this existing use of uh, hydrogen which is gray hydrogen with green hydrogen and separately market creation needs to happen for new users of hydrogen which is where earlier it was mentioned you know steel is one and mobility is probably uh, another area where hydrogen might find uh, usages so that market creation will come through policy because right now green hydrogen is much more expensive than incumbent fossil fuels so some kind of nudge or you know requirement is necessary for that displacement to happen and then to for the scale to build up. Um, so we can hope to see some form of uh, blending norms uh, for these existing users. Um, so they are right now using natural gas to produce hydrogen. So there will be requirements to uh, incrementally displace the gray with the green, uh, as well as there's the intent at least to um, blend some amount of green hydrogen in natural gas, uh, be it in the form of uh, compressed natural gas or natural gas that flows into pipelines and comes to our homes as cooking fuel. Uh, so some amount of um, uh, hydrogen will be blended there and that will also create some market. So that's something that we can hope to see. Uh, another major policy um, announcement that we can expect is uh, what is called the PLI scheme. So we have seen multiple PLI schemes coming from the government in the semiconductor space and the PV space. Uh, there's one expected for the electrolyzer uh, manufacturing space as well. Uh, the exact construct is, you know, of course, not yet known, uh, but uh, hopefully that will enable manufacturers to deploy capacity, you know, quicker than uh, the natural evolution of growth. Um, apart from that, you know, the mission document will hopefully also have some amount of support in terms of uh, R&D uh, or developing standards, etc., which are essential, although not a, a central, uh, you know, glamorous part of a mission uh, document or a policy document. They're essential for actually the market creation and ecosystem uh, development. So these are things we can hope to see in the coming weeks uh, when the mission document is actually released. Um, so that's about policy. But in anyone working in the policy space, you know, we have a saying, uh, the devil is in the implementation. So we can have great policy, but if the implementation falls off the cliff, then uh, we'll have serious problems. Uh, and the, the problems can arise in multiple ways. For one thing, there are several operational challenges, um, be it, for example, fertilizer plants. It's not only about hydrogen, but you also need you know, carbon dioxide uh, for making urea. And that carbon dioxide currently comes from the fossil fuels that they're burning, mainly natural gas, uh, or be it refineries, which are using uh, steam methane reformers. And if you displace their gray hydrogen with green hydrogen, well, the SMR unit is paid for uh, and, you know, it'll just be sitting idle. So who bears the cost of uh, the sun capital for those units? 
um and then there are other challenges such as um, end user you know ability to handle uh, natural gas plus let's say hydrogen for example in our homes we have cooking stoves but we don't know exactly what will happen if we ramp up um the blend volumes of hydrogen natural gas can those burner tips handle the hydrogen or not that's something that remains to be seen um storage is going to be another problem uh, in the medium to long term something that needs to be looked at from a policy perspective um as we grow in scale we need some form of storage uh, to be to be able to balance out the supply and demand and that needs to be thought of now uh, if in a decade we need to uh, if if we want to start to uh, storing hydrogen at scale and then finally um you know there'll be other issues and i'm sure you know my uh, next speaker so the speaker that follows me will talk about it but then land and water use are going to be serious constraints if if you look at the landscape in india the states that have the best renewable energy which is rajasthan gujarat uh, karnataka tamil nadu maharashtra are all severely water stressed and you know this will come into play uh, as we you know scale up hydrogen production um, and also the quantum of um, renewable energy that needs to be deployed just to give everyone a sense of the scale just to displace the 5.5 million tons of gray hydrogen that we produce with green hydrogen uh, we need about 110 gigawatts of renewable energy and right now india has about 89 uh, gigawatts of solar plus wind so what we have deployed thus far we'll have to just double it only to cater to the hydrogen demand that we already have uh, not to mention all the other re needed to displace uh coal based power generation in the power sector so a significant scale up is required whether we'll be able to achieve it or not will depend a lot on policy uh, and rooftop solar was mentioned earlier but there are other options as well such as deploying uh, wind offshore or looking at deploying solar uh, in water bodies etc so uh, you know a massive scale up will be required and policy will uh, essentially be the enabler for that to happen uh, and then finally and i'll close with that point uh, is a finance so we do talk about you know how much prospects there are but we need to understand that it requires huge amounts of capital uh, and again using the 5.5 million as kind of the you know base number for uh, producing green hydrogen in a decade we need about 115 billion dollars of investment uh, and you know where that will come from you know remains to be seen because we are already challenged in terms of uh, capital availability uh, for our core you know power sector re deployment itself so Uh, many policy measures uh, you know need to come you know uh, from this point on for uh, us to actually become a, a green hydrogen hub in the future so i'll stop here uh, and we'll be happy to take questions later on sure thank you uh, so much sir that was uh, really insightful and our next uh, esteemed speaker is mr n c thirumalai so he is the sector head at the strategic and uh, strategic studies at the center for study for science technology and policy also popularly known as cstep so i understand uh, sir that you will be speaking mostly on the technology part of green hydrogen so over to you sir thank you so good afternoon i hope uh, everybody can see my screen yes hello can. Yeah, we yeah. can see also. So, yeah, uh, can. thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks for this opportunity to uh, share some thoughts on uh, uh, the whole concept of green hydrogen. And uh, at C Step, uh, we are undertaking a sort of internal study to look at the sort of a macroscopic analysis of hydrogen economy in India. The idea uh, for us um, here is to look at from a whole hydrogen ecosystem, from demand, supply, and in terms of storage. and in terms of uh, materials etc and what not to look at if india's ambitious plans to go and achieve i mean various studies are already reported done by cw terry etc that the quantum of hydrogen by 2050 required will be around uh, 20 to 30 mi uh, million tons of uh, hydrogen but we also talk about the export potential that the sort of country has given the low cost uh, renewables that we are able to produce so in this context uh, we, we, we i'm just presenting some of the aspects of what we have looked at so far and uh, with respect to the sort of discussions that here um, to begin with uh, as our speakers have spoken about i just have a sort of a wagon wheel to show how what are the sources by which we can produce hydrogen and where are the demand sectors are likely to come so in terms of sources you have the fossil you can produce hydrogen using fossil fuels which is currently happening 
as a, my earlier speaker spoke about either in the refinery sector or on the fertilizer units, but also there is a new aspect of green hydrogen that is how we can produce hydrogen using renewable energy. So starting from a biomass to solar PV or any wind energy that can be used and using the electrolysis method hydrogen can be produced. And there are also people who are thinking about using nuclear electricity as it's a fossil free energy. So hydrogen can be produced. Currently in terms of demand areas where we see hydrogen currently is again in the refineries and the uh, petrochemicals, refineries, petrochemicals, and the fertilizer industries predominantly, but going ahead as my previous speaker spoke about, how do we create the demand in a sense, but these are the areas where uh, hydrogen application can be seen. But the question is how cost effective this can be. So in terms of demand areas, one big area that is always speak, spoken about when it comes to hydrogen is steel in a sense, it is one of the hard to abate sectors as they call it. So the potential for use in uh, that industry, like hydrogen can be used as both as a fuel and a feedstock. So in that sense, uh, wherever hydrogen can be directly used in the steel industry for as a reductant will, and some steel and cement predominantly. So that is something being looked at in big uh, for the long term, but also whereas other applications which have been talked about is, is other areas where it can really make a sort of a dent or push is the whole aspect of the one diesel abatement or even in transport uh, where fuel cell based vehicles can be used especially for the long, long hauls so going ahead uh, with respect to india uh, i've just put a sort of given the potentials what is the sort of abatement potential it can have and, and a sort of the first part of this talks about in the near term immediately how we can use and what is the sort of abatement potential hydrogen can bring about. So fertilizer re refineries approximately are able to currently which are using the SMR technology if adopts green hydrogen it can reduce the CO2 emissions to the tune of around 57 million tons of CO2 on an annual basis. Uh, my previous speaker spoke about the city gas distribution, the, the whole aspect of blending. That is an immediate area where already there are certain areas or si in certain cities, uh, city gas distribution, where you have the pipe network, they can be thinking about the blending of the hydrogen aspect of it. Um, another uh, uh, area for, I, we believe that um, on the near term, once the hydrogen production uh, is ramped up, is the whole aspect of diesel abatement. India, if I'm correct, uh, in 2019 or 2019, uh, used uh, uh, produced around 5 billion units of electricity using diesel. So the diesel is, a, as you are aware, diesel is a sort of a pollutant, whether it's uh, in cities, especially where large apartments are there, and most of them use uh, uh, diesel gen sets and various other uh, off-grid applications also. So the potential in terms of abatement is around 3.5 five million tons and I as I spoke about the steel part of it uh, it's again that's as a reductant which is used uh, it, it plays a very critical role so uh, these are the immediate areas that we feel in the immediate term and the sort of near term when I say near term I'm talking about 2030 these are the immediate interventions that can happen apart uh, and the other areas that which I showed in the previous screen in terms of other it could be the power sector or as a, uh, as a storage in the power sector or even other uh, applications uh, might happen once certain technologies are sort of becomes cost effective uh, once proven. So um, I'm gonna also talk about uh, given that we, we have this target and there have been talks about 1 million green, 1 million ton of green hydrogen to be produced. I'm just gonna give a perspective of what it takes to achieve that. What are the sort of challenges that sort of, uh, or uh, things that needs to be considered in a sense. So from a resource point of view, I'm going to take these four parameters of energy, land, water, and materials. And uh, just to give a perspective, energy in terms of for every million ton of green hydrogen produced, uh, we might need around 55 to 60 billion units of energy. That means around 30 to 35 gigawatts of uh, RE capacity installed. So uh, the range also 55 to 60 and also uh, is, is dependent on uh, various factors. Uh, to just give a perspective what 60 billion units is, it's almost uh, in terms of uh, Karnataka energy state as a uh, Karnataka as a state energy consumption was 
around 2017 18 was around 60 billion units per annum so that's the amount of sort of energy that will be required um, but having said that we have a big ambitious plan in re and 500 gigawatt of re plans is already been talked about and also uh, at cstep we have undertaken studies to look at where sometimes excess re capacity is available when there is peak sun there is there is peak wind and things like that and what is called as curtailment happens these units are asked to shut off on things like that so but however here is an opportunity in terms of numbers what we saw was uh, as per a study done by c step only for the southern region uh, we we have a now an all india grid but just for the southern region it was just around uh, the four or today five states rather uh, the capacity the peak capacity at one instant was around 53 gigawatts of capacity had to be sort of shut down or curtailed so in terms of there are various such instances uh, where you will see the re capacity being excess and not used so here is an opportunity where we believe hydrogen in these cases whether it could be an in situ production at the local uh, place itself or transmitting to other state wherever hydrogen production is happening would be something of interest um in terms of land uh, uh, as uh, previous speakers also spoke about this is a, becomes a sort of challenge in a sense given that the it's not about the land that would be required for the production of hydrogen um at site but it's more the upstream land requirements for producing the the clean energy or the renewable energy so roughly the, as a rule of thumb around we need 4 to 5 acres of land for every megawatt and given the sort of uh, uh, large scale plants we have and uh, sort of land being a sort of a premium resource even given the current 90 or 40 gigawatts of solar that has come or 40 odd of wind land has not been an easy thing so going ahead we believe uh, land will be even though technically on paper we know there is enough land enough wasteland available land we feel still feel would be a challenge uh, to get um, further going ahead in terms of uh, water uh, Uh, the 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 number what we understand is around the feed water that goes into the electrolyzer for production of uh, hydrogen is around around nine liters for every kg of hydrogen and when it translated to one million tons we need around nine million cubic meter of water to be given but this is the feed water but the raw water that is that that this feed water the raw water that is re- required. will be approximately one and a half to four times considering the kind of water that we are using because it has to be treated and used in the uh, electrolyzer so four times is for a number when i'm when we are looking at desalination uh, or sea water being used but two times when you are trying to use the ground water or any surface water available now again uh, if you if you are to compare to sort of where this stands with existing thermal power plants or something this is slightly higher Uh, to the current uh, uh, number in terms of the power of uh, thermal power plants use finally uh, i'm going to talk about uh, the key materials i mean uh, i we know we have uh, experts in production produce and production of electrolyzers here with us uh, in, but we see considering the sort of uh, material demand and the sort of dependency that we need to have if we need to make these uh, materials for example nickel in alkanoyl electrolyzers Uh, our understanding is around a thousand tons is required for every megawatt of uh, electrolyzer needs to be produced. Uh, similarly, the metals like platinum, iridium, roughly around three hundred to seven hundred kg per gigawatt, and rare earths like uh, uh, zirconium and uh, yttrium for the solid oxide electrolyzer cells would be on the order of five to seven tons per gigawatt of electrolyzer. So again. the sort of ecosystem that needs to be created in order to ensure that there is a smooth supply chain of these materials from wherever or even do we have the reserves or the resources to address these needs to be uh, carefully considered and uh, given that we have ambitious plans a sort of a groundwork would be imperative to look at from a resource point of view and a stable supply of all these things would be warranted for finally i have not talked about a uh, uh, storage part of it uh it's always a tricky question in a sense in situ production versus transportation uh, still a lot of r and d would be required whether it can be uh, store or transport hydrogen easily or it would be uh, in situ production would be cost effective those are the aspects that one needs to be carefully consider 
depending upon the demand centers where hydrogen is coming up and what not so with this i would like to stop here and happy to take any questions sure thank you so much sir for your presentation and uh, uh, we'll move on to uh, questions i see some of the questions have been answered by one of them by mr malia but uh, there's one about there's one from dilip kumar chetwale says why is it so late because even ships were using green hydrogen since long so uh, any uh, panelist would like to take this particular question i'm not sure if uh, ships were using no. green hydrogen for long but someone else can correct me i don't think anyone has been using green hydrogen um, no. although in military mm -hmm. applications submarines have been using uh, you know some of it but uh, i i can be correct that i know from no, i agree i agree to the best of my knowledge it has been the diesel which has been the fuel for the predominant for the ships mm -hmm. we i have not heard come across any green especially green hydrogen being used it, for ships okay there's one more from him itself it says uh, one way of for policy for blending of ethanol to reduce emissions is with diesel so have you taken emissions with 100% diesel i mean he's asking the quantum with the blending so i'm not sure what exactly he's trying to ask but he's probably saying uh, blending with ethanol to reduce emissions so can you verbally ask the question that might be easier yeah ethanol blending yeah. is more with petrol if as my understanding is uh, but uh, not with diesel to the best of my knowledge we are talking about ethanol blending e10 e8 and things like that but not diesel though but if i were to uh, understand i mean better to be and understand your question and answer so thank you sir so uh, if any of our participants have uh, questions uh, you can either uh, you know verbally ask those questions or you want to put it in the q and a box uh, then you can do that and there have been questions about presentation so we will be sharing the presentations that were presented at the webinar today we will be emailing them to the participants so uh, some some questions were that so i hope i've answered that so any more questions so you can please Ask the panelists. May I ask a question, Sapna? Sure, sure, Jay. Thanks. Uh, well, this is a question to whoever uh, of the panelists wants to take it. We have been having, in fact, it's gone up ever since the government announced its new green hydrogen policy. We have been having a whole rash of media coverage on it. Some positive, some not so positive, and. one of the things i think that's necessary is to look at what is not so positive and then look at if uh, how does one look at that what the media reports which are not so positive so one that i saw very recently was that the world moved away from hydrogen in the 1920s and 1930s after the hindenburg explosion so why are we moving back to hydrogen Uh, yeah whoever wants to take that i don't think the application is similar i think it's the the it's not analogous at all uh, we're not going to fly planes with the uh, hydrogen filled balloons um nor have we given up on hydrogen because hydrogen has been in use for decades now in refineries and fertilizers so it's not like we don't know how to handle hydrogen uh, we don't know how to safely handle it uh, it's just that the renewable energy space has evolved such that the pricing becomes you know economic right so it it's it's the favorable economics that has brought hydrogen back into the uh, limelight it's not that we have not been using it thanks that's But having said that at least and this is uh, cw's view um you know there are a whole slew of decarbonization options you know hydrogen has its place Uh, but needs to be looked at in terms of the larger portfolio of different options that are available uh, to decarbonize. Sure. Okay, so can we just there's one more question from uh, T Swaminathan which says that 
Hydrogen as a fuel has been known for a long time, but could not compete with fossil fuels earlier. Uh, to be successful, a lot of coordination is required from various ministries like coal, petroleum, and how does the new policy propose to address this? Sorry, can you repeat the last bit? Uh, policy so, proposed to what so, address what? So it says that, uh, you know, how, how do various ministries, how will they uh, coordinate to ensure that the policy is successful? Ministry of Coal, Ministry of Petroleum. So does it require like various ministries come together? So I think it's basically about... You want me to I guess the answer is yes. Question. Sorry, I, I, I don't want to, you know, take all of the space, but, you know, just my view, the answer is yes, but I don't think any one of us here on the panel is qualified to answer on behalf of the government. But the simple answer is yes. I mean, the coordination is required because uh, as of now, energy is housed in different ministries, be it Ministry of Coal, MOP, and GMNRE, uh, MOP, uh, to say the least, and some of the other, uh, you know, ministries such as DST. So yes, it will require some um, serious coordination between the ministries, not just central, but also, like I said earlier, at the state level, because uh, this is an interplay between the you know grid and uh, end users of, of green hydrogen. So um, it, it's much more complicated than just a coordination at the central level. Thank you so much. So any of our other panelists who would want to add to this particular uh question, I mean, uh, give some kind of a response. Mr. Pashupati, Mr. Thirumalai, uh, Vibhuti has unfortunately shared. I, I, I think, I think uh, with my understanding is, as far as the dialogue on hydrogen is concerned, including Niti Aayog, seven or eight different ministries have met many, many times. And uh, I don't know if it's officially formed and announced as a group of ministers or um, I've used that word I mean, I've heard of that word being used oftentimes in the topic of hydrogen. So I think they do realize that it affects many different ministries, which is why maybe even the uh, uh, the press release that came from the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy last week uh, may not have comprehensively included other elements as well, like, uh, like uh, blending and uh, uh, mandates on oil and fertilizer and all of that may not have come because I think multiple ministries are involved and the, and the respective ministries might might do the needful on their side. They, I think everybody is fully aware. I mean, it, maybe the maybe it's not been announced publicly how the coordination is going to happen, but as far as I can tell and what I've known, they've all been working very closely with each other. Sure. Thank you so much. Sir. Mr. Thirumulai, would you like to add something to that? Oh, no, no. I mean, Do we move uh, to nothing the... much, nothing much okay. the speakers have spoken about it? Okay, okay. So I, I just take one more question. Uh, it's from Rahul Modi. It says that uh, with module costs going up and aluminium procurement mandatory, how will the solar costs come down? I don't know why he's talking about solar when he's talking about green hydrogen. No, no, I, well, renewable comes from solar predominantly, so his question is still valid. <laughs> I think, look, uh, I think uh, India is obviously trying to do everything it can to create a domestic uh, uh, manufacturing ecosystem for solar, which will probably have a negative impact on cost. We have seen that already. I think domestic content requirements in solar have ended up causing 5 to 10% increase in module which in some sense he's right because it goes against uh, you know, our desire to reduce the cost of hydrogen. So I guess these are all sort of competing objectives. You know, the government, uh, you know, to be overall energy independent, we do need to have our domestic solar manufacturing. The domestic solar manufacturing is, is far, far, far behind where China is today. I think India's cell manufacturing capacity is like few gigawatts while China is probably hundred times that, right? So we're going to have to catch up and that economies of scale will reflect in the price of domestically manufactured solar modules being high relative to what one can simply import. So that's the price the government is, is paying for having a domestic solar manufacturing, but they are paying for it in the sense that they are giving production linked incentive to try and close that gap and make it still competitive. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. So I, 
I think that uh, that kind of does it with the questions that we have received so far in the Q&A box. I don't see any more questions. So uh, any more questions, if anybody has, uh, you can please direct it to us and we'll share it with uh, you know our speakers and we'll send it to them or we'll send you their mail IDs and you can send them an email directly asking your questions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the presentations which were given at the webinar today will be shared with the participants. Chapna, can so, I make one point? Sure. Is sir. it possible? Yeah, please. Yeah, so please. I, I think uh, Joydeep was talking about some of the uh, negative press around hydrogen um, mission. Some press releases I saw were questioning the capacity available for electrolyzers and whether India can really even make such a big plan. I, I think the problem is people are mentally trained by the gigawatts they hear in solar. The hydrogen manufacturing capacities can be built and expanded rather rapidly and the capital expenditure is, is quite modest. Uh, you know, we built, we built our gigafactory in four months and it started producing electrolyzers. We believe, we believe every, every global electro, electrolyzer company, if required, can come and set up shop and factories in India and, and start manufacturing substantial volume in no time. We're talking about a, a year, a less than a year. So it's not a big deal at all. It's gonna depend on the policy. If the policy requires and supports domestic manufacturing, this can be done very rapidly. It's not an issue at all. So I, you know, I don't want the press to be unduly negative on something that uh, is actually not a big barrier, not a big difference at all. But unless we do that, unless we ensure that the domestic industry or the domestic manufacturing becomes big early on, then we will be in a very similar situation like solar where a decade goes by and the Chinese industry is far more competitive. They're more competitive in cost and better in quality. I mean, the solar modules from China are both cheaper and better quality. So then you, then you have to, you have an Herculean task to come back. Whereas in hydrogen, if we start early and give, give India a chance to be the leader in the world without letting time go by, we can and we will be able to rise and make India the hub for hydrogen. Thanks, thanks so much. So uh, there was some query about, uh, so I'm from Pooja Bhattacharji, which says, how can we get in touch with the speaker? So we will be sharing the contact information and email IDs and PPTs, as I mentioned earlier. So I hope that answers your query, Pooja. And uh, somebody else is, uh, this a participant called Kinley Dorji and he says that he's a master's student from Green Energy Technology. He wants to learn with Omium about electrolyzers. So I'll share his number and details with you. Mr. Sure, sure. I've taken, I've taken his number. We'll connect okay. with him. Thank you. Okay, okay. So thank you. So uh, any more questions, we'll uh, direct them to the uh, panelists directly through their mail. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of all my colleagues and uh, you know, uh, help us put this to, uh, together, this webinar. Thank you so much to all the panelists for their insight into uh, this concept, which we are hearing, but we are not very familiar about, we're still learning about it. So thank you so much for your time and for all the details that you've shared with us. And uh, so on this note, I would like to uh, say goodbye and uh, wind up this particular session. Thank you once again. Thanks. Joy Thank Deep, you. Any, uh, yeah, Thank I just you. asked my no, colleagues, Joy Deep and Arushi, no, no. if they would like to say something. More. No, that's fine. That's fine. Thanks. Thanks a lot to all panelists. Thanks to you, Sapna, for moderating this so ably. And thanks to all participants for participating on a very news heavy day. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Joy Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.